What's up, everyone? We are live here on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And I got with us a very special and a very fun guest today. And we're going to do an AMA, which we kind of do for all of our lives. Um, we address all of your questions. But I got someone special. I got Liz Cohen. Liz Cohen, former uh, VP Marketing of Our Crowd, she was there for over six years. Um, and Liz, so I want to introduce you, but I feel like you do the best justice for yourself. So okay. why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit personally, kind of like your story. And yeah, how you got here and your experience with marketing, tech, and VCs. And we'll take it from there. Sure thing. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Liz Cohen. I have been in Israel for 15 years. Um, I moved here from New York, specifically Staten Island. So comment with all your Staten Island jokes. It's totally fine. I've heard every single one. Um, I came here at, with a kind of journalist background. I had majored in political science. I had done journalism in New York and I was kind of figuring out where I was going to end up. And I kind of fell into marketing. I started here at answers.com, which at the time was this major US platform, user generated content, Q and A wiki content. It was also a bit of a Jerusalem darling back in those days. So I kind of grew up and got my guerrilla marketing education at answers. Um, it was fascinating kind of bridging community and product with all the guerrilla marketing in between. Anyone who was around 15 years ago knows what I'm talking about. It was way before Facebook had business pages or Twitter even existed. From there, I well, Answers.com was acquired in 2011 and kind of brought over to the States. I ended up uh, working in consulting with a former boss and a former colleague. So I actually got my hands on working with very, very early stage startups, like seeds of startups where they didn't even have sort of their branding and their marketing yet. and we were kind of helping them get it off the ground, doing a lot of video for them. That was a very startup focused perspective. Did that for a few years. And then we fast forward to our crowd where I ended up being on the complete opposite side of that, which was VC, an area of the startup world I had not had exposure to directly before. And it gave me this completely different perspective on Israeli high tech, the startup ecosystem, startups from the perspectives of investors, obviously, and also a perspective of what startups need from sort of like a, a VC angle where, you know, you've, you're mainly experienced partners who know the startup landscape and they're able to offer startups something a bit more. So the relationship is just totally different and it can be super constructive, obviously, if you're doing it right. So that was totally eye-opening. At Our Crowd, I, where I was there for over six years, I left this past summer. But what I was focused on was kind of a giant mixture because Our Crowd, as probably a lot of people know, it's not your typical VC. It's also an equity crowdfunding platform, which means that investors from around the world can join and actually invest via the platform like any other VC. So we were catering to an investor audience as well as our own startup portfolio, which obviously in VC, you know, you're only as good as your portfolio and your growth and, and the returns on investment. So it was kind of always being in a few different mindsets when you're working on something like that. Um, so is, yeah. it a is it a marketplace in a way? Would you say it's kind of like a marketplace? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it kind of reminded me of a marketplace. Yeah, yeah. So basically you have the option to invest in whatever you want. There's there's offerings that can be anything from what you call a venture fund to specific startups where you can kind of build your own portfolio with your own guiding light, or you know, there were various different products kind of in between. So I would say that for the beginner startup investor, it's a great platform because you have options to kind of get your feet wet and you know, understanding the background, which is you don't just invest in one or two companies and sit there for a few years, you have to invest in a bunch and see how you do. And there's a whole way of going about it as an individual investor. So if you want to kind of get into that, that game, then that's a great way to do it. Um, by the way, there's another part of our crowd that I don't think a lot of people realize, which is it's very uh, connected in the institutional community. There's institutional investors, family offices, there are banking partners that are offering it through, um, through their channels. There's like a lot of different aspects to it. So with so many like audiences and targets and types, it, it's always kind of a mental exercise and try to make sure you're getting the right message to the right one. Awesome. Great. Okay. So a few things first, 
we got right before we went live, in addition to something that I can't share here, but we were talking about the thing about uh, AMA. First off, uh, I love it. Shui Fogel says he's watching with high expectations, no pressure. Hi, Shui. Uh, <laughs> first off, um, this is going to be the best live yet. So uh, keep it coming. So let's talk a little bit about AMA, and then I want to talk a little bit about marketing, and we'll get into kind of that and how we're able to attract VCs and all that. So you said something that was interesting. You said, I always prefer an AMA or a Q&A than someone talking, right? Totally well, yeah, I, I was saying, yeah, like when I'm at a con when I'm speaking at a conference or an event, the presentation's fine. I like to keep it short because honestly, the Q and A is the best part. So of course, this is you don't it. get to demonstrate your expertise. You're not answering. You're just someone has a question. You're usually yeah. answering like half that. I remember learning this in school, thinking it was bullshit. I remember a teacher teach that it was like middle school. She goes, "Ask any question you have. There's no such thing as a bad question," which is a lie. But she goes, "If you have a question, chances are half of the class is thinking the same thing." So you're right. actually whatever. And but right. that part there's true to it. In general, when you have a question, 95% of the time it's a great question. And so many people are saying, hey, thanks for be having courage is the wrong word, but thanks for speaking up and asking yeah. the right question. You know, 5% of the time everyone's like, did he really just ask that question? But <laughs> the, odds. the flip side of that is like even I sometimes don't even think of the points that people are asking me about, and it's kind of like tickled my brain or brainstormed exactly for me. Exactly right. And you yeah. get better. Right. So some, some of my best posts um, on LinkedIn actually come from clients asking questions on calls. Same. And I go, that's a great, that's a good question and yeah. answer. And then I say, you just inspired a post. And yeah. I go, I'm going to, and then I tag them at the end of the post, give them a little hat totally. tip. And when, like, someone asked me like, why do you randomly tag people at the end of your LinkedIn <laughs> posts? And I was like, because it was inspired by someone. And yeah. that's why, uh, and that's why I do it. It's going to be, it's gonna be lit. Is that lit? Is it going to be fire? How would you translate that emoji? Because they use it as an adjective. On fire, flaming, uh, whatever. It's I all good. That, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not very good at You know what? You know what's the scariest thing? My father got better at emojis than me. <laughs> he's, is he the on fire or are you? I'm not sure. I, was I don't know. One day he started using emojis. Like I wrote thing and he was like, like two emojis, like perfectly, like really well. My wife's also really good at this. And then I wrote back, Abba? Question mark. Like it is you. Right, right. And he's like, what? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, all right. <laughs> I see what happened. This is what happened. Right, to totally. Speak to your dad more often. All right, uh, Ashir asks. Uh, good afternoon. I hope I wanted. Okay. Uh, someone wants to create an app platform. After speaking with many colleagues in the industry, my concept is pretty good. My only issue is finding a Solidwell developer. There's a lot that goes on in this app. And my question is, how can I organize myself, my mind on paper, to get these organizations in design? Okay. Um, so I'm going to address that because I'm doing this right now. So uh, Asher, we're building a cybersecurity influencer uh, web app. It's not... Uh, it, and it's a marketplace, which is why I asked you if our was a marketplace because we're working on that now. We're basically cybersecurity marketing companies. We have about a dozen of them, and we have like 40 influencers that come grab links and share them, and it's a distribution platform, and we're building it now. We found a team in Ukrainians. One thing I learned into this, which you must do, is when you hire a team, if you hire an external team, you must hire someone as an advocate for you who's also a developer that you can pay hourly that would join the calls, understand what's going on. Because if not, it's not that you'll be taken advantage of. You don't really understand the expectations and some of the lingo. So that's my thoughts. How would you answer Asher's question? Wait, let's pull it up. Can I show it? There you go. Jeez, that's a long question, hey. Asher. You're getting rid of half of our face. Hey. <laughs> I'm going to have to remove that too long. Uh, what are your thoughts? I haven't been on that side of things, but what I would tell anyone when I get asked about really, really early concepts is talking to people is extremely important. Talking to people who have done it, kicking off, you know, just kind of like kicking off your idea with other people, getting feedback. Um, people are connected and can bring you to the right people sometimes. Don't be afraid to talk to people that are in the same space. Like, I think that, um, I don't know, me personally, I get a little like super private, right? And I keep things secret and I want to wait till it's like really good. But I actually think that's not always the best way to go about these things. So just keep talking to people. I think it will lead you in directions you don't expect. That's that's what I would say. Oh, I actually got some good, good advice from, uh, do you know Jonathan Karras? He's kind of Jerusalem based. He's Anglo. I'm not no? sure. Okay. Yeah, maybe. okay. He's more, more on, the, on the developer side. So when I was looking to do mine and I... Uh, 
my influencer uh, platform, my cybersecurity influencer, and I asked him for advice. He said, don't create it yet. He said, you have to do a proof of concept to make sure it works, whether right. it's a spreadsheet or something. So we'll, we use an affiliate network that can track all the clicks and every influencer, other log in, and had everything we needed for like an, to prove that, it, it, that it's worthwhile. Right. We did that for six months. It worked. And now we're working with developers and it should be ready at the end of the year. So that's also some other, I who like watched a lot of Gary Vee back in the day. And like, and you watch his performances, you're like, okay, these are all redundant, but the Q and A's are always different. And often conversations is actually how I get better at things. So my calendar is full of conversations and yeah. that's how you learn. That's how you stimulate, stimulate your brain and mind. And I'm already starting to think differently just by communicating with you. And I hope other people being able to hear you are also able to think and communicate and frame things differently. Um, and hopefully if you ask your questions, you'll get, uh, you'll get, you'll get more. Asher says cool. it helps a lot. Thanks a million. Oh, great. We're happy Yay. we can help. Um, Great. Yeah. So the Q and A in, in general conversations is where all of the values are, um, which is why uh, my least favorite thing ever is uh, what's it called? Not a round table. Uh, what's it called when you got like four people on a stage sitting down? Panel. Panel. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so the worst things ever. No offense. I know our crowd does them because they try to get a lot of people on that. Everyone does our crowd about panels, but it's like, what do you think? And then someone sits there and they're not listening. Anyone else the question and they give the same answer. And, <laughs> and I'm like, where's the debate? Where's the fire? Like, let's, let's, yeah, it's like yeah, it's, yeah. Somewhere, right? It's rare that you anyway. find a really good panel. It's true. But yeah, the right. people have to really sync and they have to want to be there. That's the key. A lot of the times the people are there because they were asked. They're not there because they want to be there. Mm -hmm. By different. the way, just because just, you got a fan here and Sharon, she says it's a great idea to have you on, which I totally agree. That's why she's here. Thank the you. only ideas I have are good ideas. What a coincidence. <laughs> uh, uh, that's actually from the movie Grandma's Boy. Do you know that movie? No. no? Okay. I'm too mature. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Adam Taylor directed it. Benjamin Adelaide, does VC marketing vary at all from conventional marketing? Um, so if by VC marketing, you mean that there's two things that I'm thinking of when you say VC marketing, and we can talk about both. One of them is marketing to VCs as let's say a consultant or a provider uh, providing marketing services. And another one is being in VC and being a marketer in VC. So I'll cover the first one first. Um, if you're looking to reach VCs, this goes back to the conversation that you all and I had a few weeks ago that led to this AMA. I think the most important thing to remember when it comes to VCs is, I kind of alluded to this before, the goal for a VC is to make sure that the portfolio works and stands out and their companies are successful. If the companies are not successful, there's no point. There's nothing to talk about. So if you have something to offer that is going to strengthen portfolio companies, make them gain traction, help them in some way, advance them, whatever it is, that's the point of view you should be coming from. And that's where you should start any conversation. So for example, like, I was giving this some thought the other day, and if you have a niche, if you have a sector that you specialize in, um, we were talking about UL specializing in cybersecurity and things like that, make it really clear that you know what you're talking about and then you have what to offer. Show what you have to offer. Show numbers. Show your own traction. Think like a VC. A VC talking to Wait, a hold on, hold on. I want to interrupt yeah, you. Sure. I'm, I'm yeah, coming yeah. Okay, so numbers, right? Yeah. Don't they think that a lot of numbers are bullshit manipulated and projected on things that they want? Like, this is my opinion on case studies. Some people ask me right. have case studies. I'm like, yeah. here's a book of 50 referrals with their cell phone numbers. Call them, right? Like, like I, I can show you, I can manipulate whatever I want and throw that yeah. uh, quote from a recommendation and I'm great like anyone else can. But like, yeah. speak to them. I mean, I can't show you their accounts. Here's a written recommendation. Here's a video testimonial. Here yeah. You can call them, right? So I didn't understand. So, don't VCs I'll, I'll, get such bullshit and there's no way to know what numbers are not? I'll are say that right? out of anyone, VCs are the most primed to see through the shit when it comes to numbers, right? Because like in any pitch deck, you know exactly what you can kind of swipe away or, or dig deeper or ask the tough questions about. So you're not fooling anyone when it comes to like pitching a VC and showing bullshit numbers. But I think there's stories you can tell that don't necessarily have to be we got this percentage of that. I think that there are more holistic or, you know, um, anecdotal stories or examples that you can show. Like if you have real life examples, like I got X to two X on this, whatever. I mean, I don't know. I'm being vague here, but if you can show stuff that actually happened in the real world, then that's, it has to be tangible. So if you can make it tangible, then do that. That's really the bottom line. Can you um, give an example like of a company that we all know, how it would make it uh, tangible if it was early stage? 
Like, how, how do you make something tangible that's like you're looking for investing might be seed or just like it's not tangible yeah. you don't have revenue yet. You have right. an idea, you have some tech, you have the right people that have experience. How do you make something tangible to solve a solution mm -hmm. that uh, that doesn't like the solution doesn't exist already, right? There's a problem you're solving. How do you make it tangible? You're talking about for the marketer that's pitching to, or the for, no, for the tech company to market yeah. to a VC. Ah, yeah, no, that's tough. That is tough. I, um, I think when it comes to when you're super, super early, you have to have a solid team where you can use your background to show that tangible aspect. If you can show in your background that you have experience doing X, Y, Z, and you can prove it because you've been there. I think the hardest thing sometimes is a first timer because um, you can't rely on that. But that's where maybe, you know, where references, connections, like people who can speak on your behalf, that's, or, you know, that's where it comes. Cause like having 8,200 in your background will get you so far or, or whatever it is. But I think that you, it is harder for a first timer. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't take that away from you as a first timer, but I think as much as you can kind of create a story around yourself that shows what you're equipped with as a person, that's something too, that I think is really important if you're a startup. And as a marketer reaching VCs, it's similar, right? So you can show what you've done. You can show, you know, what startups you've worked with or what companies you've worked with or what your background's like or where you come from or your perspective. And I think you just always have to remember that at the end of the day, all the VC really wants is to make his, or her company stronger and better and grow and popular and whatever. And so if you can tap into that and show that value, um, the magic word when it comes to VCs is value add. They all talk about value add because what they're trying to tell startups to come and take money from them, sometimes it's a chase, right? It's the other way around. They're chasing a really good company to get in there. We can give you value add. Here's what we can show you. Here's what we've done. They're doing their own pitching. So tap into that. Tap into that need to create value add. That, that's like the biggest thing when you're going in that direction. Awesome. Um, yeah. oh, we got a lot of questions here. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So Helen, I don't think it's the moderator. I wouldn't address this. I know we're bringing it back and then we're going to bring another VC question because <laughs> this bothers me. It's not. I've seen presentations from geniuses that everyone wants to hear and then they get on stage and they're, it's personality. They're boring. So the moderator needs to like pivot them against each other and say, he said this, don't you disagree kind of, but often you need to have people that speak. They must be interesting. The same thing if you do a presentation for VCs. Okay. Noah wants to know, in your opinion, is it better to approach your offer to a VC who operates in your physical environment, let's say Israel, or who operates in your specific niche? That's interesting. So if you're going to go, let's say, here's my short list of ones that I should pursue. Should you pursue ones that are local or pursue ones that are in your niche? I have an opinion, but you know better. So you go first. I will say that, of course, I'll just put out a caveat that, of course, it depends what you do and blah, blah, blah. But moving all that aside, um, if I had to pick one, I would say specific niche. I've heard of companies that they try the local Israeli scene. Nobody got it. Nobody saw it for whatever reason, blah, blah, blah. And they went outside of Israel and they got tons of funding. And I think sometimes your locale kind of speaks to what you're doing and sometimes it has nothing to do with it. So I would say somebody who understands you, a VC who actually gets what you're doing is the most important thing because they need to back you. They need to believe in you. And then they're going to strengthen you and give you that value add. And they need to understand you and, and kind of be there for you. So I think it's probably more valuable for both of you to go with a VC who actually gets you. Um, plus that VC is more connected in your industry, probably, let's say, let's say that, you know, it's healthcare. Um, and the VC is specializing in medical, they clearly have better connections to help you out. So I would probably focus more on that. Okay, no, I totally agree with the niche. And like you said, exactly right. It's the, it's the value add. So just uh, a quick example. What's good about local is they might know similar people, might be easier to connect to in some way. But let's just say I was considering um, investment for our influencer platform, and it would have only been people that are networked with cybersecurity companies or influencers. That's the value add to me. If not, then money's worth money's worthless right. if we can't get more than that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, uh, Charlene says well, she likes the eighty two hundred reference. Many people. That's all you need. Uh, can you elaborate on that? First off, you want to tell me what the what. Oh, sure. Is. Yeah. Um, Shimon Amatai, 8200, it's a unit in the army that specializes. It's a very like high quality unit that specializes in tech and, and it's it's got this brand name to it. And so, you know, it's something that people tout when, and it's totally fine. You should tout it if you were in that unit. And the truth is that a lot of, um, a lot of people outside of Israel know that that's a big deal. And there's a story around it and that's totally fine. It's just not everything. I mean, um, there are plenty of really successful companies 
out of Israel that did not have a 200 entrepreneurs behind them. Um, there are plenty that did and they didn't go anywhere. I mean, it's okay. Like, I, I just think that like, don't, you know, don't get yourself down because you weren't in a good army unit. Like, is that, was that, was that, is that overrated? Is it like bullshit now? I think probably earlier on it, it was, you know, I think, look, we saw a lot. Is it of like Harvard? Out. Is it like Harvard? Like, wow, you went to Harvard. Now it's like, I am Harvard. You're probably taught things that were old and not like adaptable and like and you're like you paid too much you know what i mean it's like i don't know it depends not law or business but like i think it's i think it's probably a living breathing organism that evolves as much as any other you know living breathing organism like the army grows but um but yeah i'm just saying it's it doesn't have to be everything and we don't have to you know focus on it totally i think that's a little bit passe but yeah. yeah, I think if someone, yeah, I, look, it's worthwhile, but it's probably overrated. Uh, Helen asks, uh, people love you. What's up with that? Oh, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> How do you show results when you don't have results? Your team experience, uh, why you're set up to succeed, right? So it's like, it's the chicken and egg thing, right? So yeah. it's like, like how we know you're going to make money? You don't have any revenue. Yeah, I can't make any revenue until I get funding. Well, I'm not going to give you funding because I don't have revenue or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, what would you recommend, let's say, for tech companies trying to, uh, uh, let's say, attract VCs here? Uh, how can you show results and what you can do? Yeah. If what they're asking for you haven't done yet. So yeah, look. First of all, VCs know this. I mean, it's not like it's not like they're expecting you to make up stuff. But I think how you present yourself is really important. And Helen, for sure, knows this probably even better than I do. Um, but yeah, I think storytelling from the very beginning, I think it doesn't come naturally to everybody. Um, not everybody understand what that means, but you know, uh, you hear the word storytelling, it's a bit of a buzzy word now, but it doesn't have to mean some really great pitch video or beautiful branding. Actually, it starts with what your like <clears throat> one sentence uh, mission is. I mean, can you explain what you do in plain English that people will, you know, lay people will understand? Can you do that? Can you carry that message across? If you can, you're already doing a better job of then like expanding it out and showing the possibilities and actually like, you know, showing who you're pitching to the possibility of where this could go. But if what you're starting from a very, um, technical or specific or whatever kind of point of view that doesn't speak to me as a human, you know, remember we're talking to people here, you're not going to get very far because everybody's tuned out. So start with the humanness, start with what you're actually like, you know, thinking about solving, whatever. And then, you know, you can dive, you can dive into the technical and whatever, but that's something that that's free, right? Like, okay, you might have to pay someone to help you out with it. But at the end of the day, I'm a human talking to a human. I can figure out how to say this in a way that I can make you understand, or at least I hope. Uh, how often do uh, VCs get pitched all the time, right? There's a follow-up questions here. I'm not asking yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stupid question. <laughs> I go back to my earlier statement. Um, so, I mean, how do you stand out in a way, right? Like, yeah. is there like if you got an elevator pitch? Let's say you're in. A, let's say you're at an hour crowd event, and there's like thousands of people there. Yeah, tech company. Uh, VCs, and these VCs are going out and they're going to speak to 100 tech companies. And mm -hmm. not to mention you're a tech company looking for funding and you're literally speaking to 100 VCs over the course of a day, right? So yeah. how do, as if you're trying to, and by the way, this goes for, I think, individuals, personal development, sales, marketing, position yourself, looking for employment, right? Mm -hmm. People are going by a lot of CVs. They're having yeah. a lot of first touch phone calls, interviews. I had three today, for example, for our team. How do you stand out? So yeah. if you were to stand out, I mean, okay, be authentic, be authentic. People can't tell if you're authentic or not so much. You got to do some personality in a few sentences, right? Yeah. Like, uh, how are you different from them or anything else? Or what's the value add? If you, there's either like for an elevator pitch or trying to capture their attention or be memorable for a VC that's, let's say, literally speaking to a hundred or let's say, no, 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 whatever, a half a dozen or a dozen, whatever. Let's say, you know, a few dozen a week, they're being pitched. Yeah. They come by, how, how do you... How do you get that over in, in a sentence or two, at, at least to buy another sentence? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give two points. And one of them, it sucks to hear it, but it's a fact of life. Um, and it actually goes back to Noah's question about Nietzsche. 
it sucks, but connections, like it's just true, right? So let's let's just say you have connections and you're great. That's one foot in great. But let's say you don't have connections. Let's let's pretend that that's the case. Um, finding the people to talk to who actually are interested in what you're going to talk about. So if I'm a early stage cybersecurity solution and I have a great idea and I don't really know anyone yet, but I can approach VCs or any whatever it is, corporates, whatever that are have the problem that I am solving or understand the problem that I'm solving. That's the first step. Don't, I wouldn't like spray and pray when it comes to VCs. Like I would focus on the VCs that are actually focused on what you're talking about, because that already, you're talking to someone who already has a high potential for sympathizing with the problem or understanding what you're talking about. So that's that. But then the other thing I would say is, um, as far as like, you know, your pitch, your sentence, whatever, um, I'm gonna say this, this also sucks to hear, but it's just true. You need a good pitch deck. You need good materials. And they don't have to be million dollar designers doing them, but they need some basic, like... Um, What's the basics? List good it. good grammar, good spelling, good, good text. <laughs> if you're gonna going. spend, I'm sorry, I have to say this. I because I have seen No, totally please do. It's, 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 just, it's hilarious because it's a re, it's a reflection of how ridiculous this market is. It sucks, but it's true. And if you have like a hundred bucks to spend and all you can afford is uh is an English speaking high school student. Oh, like, like grammarly is free. It, whatever, just figure it I mean, out. But I'm just you gotta, grammarly, grammarly is free. Just, or put it, it in just, Word document, copy paste yeah, it. And look, press it, seven for spell and grammar check. You you wouldn't walk into your pitch meeting with like a ripped t shirt and like I was gonna go there. And, yeah, I thought you, you were going to say that. the number one rule, like the first thing is don't look like a schlump because many people in this country yeah, look like I a schlump. But, you know, you can wear your cute, you know, Google T-shirt if you want, whatever. Like, but but you're not going to walk in with, like, your pit stains and, and your broken glasses. Like, you're going to, like, at least, I don't know. But but it's the same thing with your presentation. Like, you've got to think of it as, like, it's, it's showing who you are for a second. And, again, you don't need a million-dollar designer. But your logo could be on every slide. Like, I've seen pitch decks where the logo is not even on the slot, like, on the deck. Like, there are certain, and I actually, speaking of where you've had clients ask you questions and you wrote posts, I started a Medium post that I didn't finish, maybe I will, with like the super basics for a deck. Yeah, like, fits. The it's like it's needed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it really actually does matter. It has to be easy to consume. Because again, if I'm looking at 20, I mean, it's not me, it's the investment team. But if, if I'm looking at, you know, however many decks a day. And if I'm even like the lowest on the totem pole doing it first, which is a lot of times the case, right? You've got to at least catch my eye with a good quality deck. And knowing that a lot of the people, their applications are going to suck, you'll stand out by having a very clear and well-worded and well-put-together concept in whatever so material, one page or a deck, whatever. I have an idea for you. Okay, this is what I think you should do, which you won't, but maybe you will. So I used to do this thing back in the day, a few years ago for fun. I did like a few of them and then there were always assholes being critical is where with people's permission, I'd publicly rip up their profile, their LinkedIn profile, right. like deconstruct <laughs> it. Yeah, like, yeah. and I bring, in, I, like, I bring in my really sweet personality, a little bit of sarcasm. <laughs> uh, what if you did uh, like, like, I will rip your pitch deck publicly You'll get publicity. <laughs> VCs will watch your shows because they're seeing it and you're funny, right? Because right? Right, you're right. hilarious. You have a great personality. And then people, everyone gets to see, oh, I do that on my pitch deck. And everyone gets right. a free review of their pitch deck that would have cost them maybe, I don't know, $1,000 to, to really get that real rip over. And you can do it for free. You elevate your brand. You elevate them to VCs. And you no, that's a good idea. That is legit. What do you think? Idea. That's actually the something. Marketer to marketer here. <laughs> I did something like that that was super fun. It, totally good hearted. Like not not in a mean way, but at Mass Challenge a little while ago where I was doing people's one pagers, that was like live. They'd send me their one pager and I'd mm -hmm. rip it up and it was fun. So yeah, that's an idea. I'll keep that one in mind. Yo, I've got, totally I've got time on my hands. Which is why I don't go to college unless you're in STEM. <laughs> Biggest waste of time and money. I'm a huge advocate of not going to college. It's the stupidest thing you can do. Uh, that would Scott's make a good just, AMA topic. Uh, dude, don't get, I get angry. I get really angry about, mm. and I have an MBA and I study finance national business. I get graduate magna cum laude. I was a treasure, like, <laughs> like everything. Okay. Yeah. Everything. And I'm like, fuck this. Anyway, uh, 
by the way, whatever. Sorry for cursing. I, I have my own rules of cursing that you can do it in video, but you can't do it in text on LinkedIn, uh, on long form video, not short term form video. Uh, Vadim, what's up, Vadim? Vadim says, uh, what do you think is the biggest game changer in post COVID era marketing? He knows it's generic. So let's talk about marketing and pitching to VCs. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about it just from a tech perspective in general yeah. for what we do with our clients. Mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, our clients, they target their cybersecurity and tech companies that are targeting enterprises, usually around the AB funding and, and more. Things don't change because the enterprises are doing very well. They're doing okay. A lot of the regulations and the stimulus and bonuses in the United States, for example, they want to help and keep people employed. That's easiest to do with most stable businesses. Unfortunately, they help bigger companies more than it did smaller companies. It sucks. So therefore, they still have the money and it actually removed a lot of their competition out of the market, um, which is a great, huge advantage to them. Um, and we always have lobbyists regulating, trying to keep small businesses out. So, um, I don't. I think actually it plays to your advantage now that people see that the COVID is behind them, at least everywhere but Israel. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about? Oh, God. <laughs> Another place. Sorry. 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 <laughs> That's for my rant channel. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, if do you think do you, if you're pitching to uh, investors, have things changed now than let's say a year ago? The way you got to pitch, are they? Are they? I mean, at the beginning, obviously of COVID, but like, are they? I think much more conscious of how I'm spending my money now or not because it looks like there's a V-shaped recovery. I think like the Dow hit like an all time high yesterday or something. Yeah. So I'll say this. First of all, I, um, I've been out of the game for a few months and I can speak to like a few months ago, but, and it seems like it's everything in general is just changing all the time. But I will say that, yes, in the beginning of COVID, um, Purses got a little tighter. People were freaked out totally naturally, right? It was a little freaky. All of a sudden, there was a shift um, towards healthcare. And I'm talking now about like our investors at our crowd, what they were starting to become more interested in as well as us. But what was interesting was that our crowd was actually really invested in healthcare for a long time. You know, we already had a digital health fund. Um, we had a very large healthcare portfolio. At one point, I think it was the largest in Israel. I don't remember. But um, but yeah, like it's it, it, was, it was always a thing. But suddenly, investors were like, healthcare. Yeah, well, let's do that. So we became a bit more focused. They became a bit more focused. I think in general that that's probably kind of spread out a little bit since since everything's kind of changing and evolving and in a weird way settling into a new world. But um, but going forward, look, like I would say in general that everything's tough now. And it doesn't matter even like what you're what you're marketing. If you're pitching your startup, if you're pitching yourself, if you're pitching your product, whatever it is that you're trying to reach out about, everything is a little bit tough right now. I think we're all kind of a little lower energy than we usually are. The whole world is kind of breathing this like sigh and we're, we're waiting to figure things out and hopefully that'll be different in another six months. But I would say that one thing that we noticed and I'm gonna like veer a little bit into marketing in general, um, when the pandemic started, the shift to everything being online, people suddenly coming out from you know, in front of the camera instead of not doing video as much and 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 all of a sudden we're consuming constantly because there was nothing else to do. I think the people standing out are the people who can actually get in front of camera or make their voice heard and build, and I hate this buzzy word, but it's true, that thought leadership perspective. Put your knowledge out on the table people are consuming and build yourself up in that way. Make sure that people understand you have a topic, you have a niche, you have a solution, you have a whatever. You can express it in whatever medium makes sense for you. If that's video, if it's articles, if it's podcasting, if it's whatever. Um, and do it. Like keep doing it. Because the more you build that up, you're going to expand, you know, your voice. You're going to be able to reach more people. You're going to have something to, to point people to when they want to understand who you are. Your name is going to get out there. Your, your ideas are going to get out there. So anyone, no matter what you're doing, figure out if you're like having a conversation and, and how you're doing it and making sure you're getting it across. Because this is the time. Like we're all stuck at home. Do it now. So then in six right. months, you're out there. You're already there. Okay. So uh, first off, uh, excellent point. Uh, uh, okay, I want to say two things at once that aren't related. So this is a problem with my, my multiple brains. So I don't know if anyone else can relate. Uh, yes, but what you're saying is yes. First off, Vadim also sent me a private message about 8200, 8, which is very true. That he said just by having 8200, it means you have a certain kind of intellect. 
which is true. And yeah, it's you illegal. Got into it. Yeah, 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 and it's it's illegal to at least in the states. I don't know about here. It's illegal to give people IQ tests in order to be able to. It's just illegal, okay? But okay. universities in a four-year degree in specific fields mm. demonstrates you have a certain IQ. Interesting. Which is so people know that that is like a, that is a Q. Like, oh, you did you yeah. have an IQ, right? Or if like if you worked at yeah. Google, you worked there for two years, you have a certain IQ. Okay, Google's right. overrated, and then right. you probably stayed in the sleeping pod and went there for the food and didn't do shit. But in order right. to stay employed there for two years, yeah. especially because it's a, you were worth something, you totally. you got something going on. Yeah. So e even though those things might be overrated in what yeah. you actually learn, it is a filtering mechanism for employment. I would never hide it. Yeah, hundred percent. I would never I mean, hide it. For it. sure. Yeah, you I it, it, if you, got if it, you don't it. have it, if you don't have it, don't pack your bags and run away and like live in a fart. Oh okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like. Oh, just say too good. Say you got to write that you rejected eighty two hundred. You said there were there are too many snobs at eighty two hundred. Right. Uh, yeah, there's also supposedly a lot of brainwashing going on there. Anyway, uh, let's see what's up. Uh, Margie Haddad, nice to meet you. Very informative. Thank you. Okay, this is funny because Ayala, she's on our team. She was one of our cybersecurity influencer marketer. I told her a few days ago, maybe last week, I said, I need to start cursing less. And so she said that there's going to be a chocolate, the money in the chocolate jar. Yeah. So I, I uh, so it's a funny comment. Other people might we have that. We have that yeah. at our crowd because I curse too much. You do so. I used to not, and I used to complain yeah. that, like, to my, my wife, I'm like, dude, you curse too much. And then I started cursing a lot. I don't even know why or how. Who am I spoken <laughs> to? I don't know. Yeah. And then I started cursing more. And they're like, I think I curse more than her. So, like, I got to scale it back. And then you, you lose its value when you want to use it. You got to use yeah. the F1 well. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Sharon says, okay. okay, so this is great. The Nobel Prize winner in literature this year never got a BA. Guess what? Wait. Because of PC, yeah. that they don't teach anymore for literature degree, an English degree in America. In a lot of like uh, in colleges, they've become so radical that they don't even teach you uh, Shakespeare. It's I'm like, oh, it's, it's, you, why, it's ridiculous. They don't, you don't learn any. I mean, that's why other than STEM. But it goes to show, by the way, you don't, the BA is worthless to you. Mm -hmm. uh, here, actually, Vadim talks more about this. It moves you from, the idea of smartness, okay, moves you. Okay, I'm not going to go into that, but it's a good point. Okay, awesome, great. All right, so let me ask you, let's go, uh, let's talk a little bit about, so we understand, okay, pitch decks are imperative. If you have, Let's say let's talk elevator pitch. Your tech company elevator pitch is. Do you have any advice? If you got elevator pitch, you got three sentences. What would you not say? Usually, I feel like I feel like people are looking for. Tell me if I'm wrong. VCs are looking for, and as an employer, sometimes they look for this too. They look for red flags to know. Okay, this person's a waste of my time. Don't continue speaking to them. Is that accurate, or am I guessing? Or am I accurately guessing? I think it's natural, right? Like we're all kind of on our guard looking for whether things are a waste of our time or not. I hope so. I mean, but it's a skill, intuition. right? Right. Yeah. Well, of course. I guess it's intuition, right? I think when you have a limited amount of time and you have a ton of, you know, fire hosed startups at you, you're going to, you're going to have to weed it out. Um, I'm not the person that was pitched to in our crowd ever. I, I always received the material afterwards when one of the investment team would ask me, like, what do you think of this or blah, blah, blah. Or I had to actually work on the campaign for it. And I'd see some sometimes amazing things, sometimes horrendous things. But, um, but I would say that, again, like, practice, when it comes to messaging, you have to remember, again, that you're talking to people. And so what, what I tell people to do is, if you're on Twitter, Twitter's like a great tool. Sometimes I do this. I open Twitter because of the character limit and I, I wanna say something and I use the box as like a, time, a timer, like a written timer. Like say what I have to say, but then I have to keep cutting it down to make sure it fits and try to weed out what I'm really trying to say. There's another concept that Bob Rosenshine, my, C, my first CEO at Answers and my mentor always, like he, he told me this was, you know, omit useless words. Just oh, yes. get, get rid yes. of the words that are not, doing anything for you nobody it, it's unnecessary so that's why the twitter box is so great just to use it to try to like delete the things you don't need oh, i know you can that's do it in a, a lot copy, of ways a copy it's like crap we have to fit this messaging in these many characters yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And then and, and think, divide it into two or three sentences and, well i want to be one big sentence it's like a, right yes, and it, it's a teaching moment because a lot of people mean well they're very passionate about what they're doing which is great i mean that passion will show as you're speaking or, or whatever it is you're doing but but you have to also remember to keep it focused because the person you're talking to is not yet as passionate as you and you you're, you're trying to reach them and and so to be 
respectful of the time limit, which is what the elevator pitch is about, and to be, you know, interesting enough and, and show your passion, but also remember that at the end of the day, they have to walk away with one, you know, our, our brains, our attention spans, you know, always think about Sesame Street, right? The fact that those clips are like two minutes long. So you have to remember that, that that's who you're talking to, no matter who you're talking to. So I like to say, you know, use tools, use the Twitter box, just because it comes with an ingrained, you know, an ingrained uh, counter, whatever, but but use something that's going to force you to write and rewrite and rewrite and then go test it on people, test it on everyone, test it on different people, people that, you know, you know, your ADHD mother-in-law or your, you know, whatever younger sibling, I don't know, just test it on everybody that, you know, just to get feedback on, wait, I didn't understand that word. Or what did you mean by that? You never know the person you're talking to, what they're going to pick up on. So I've so, done that in the supermarket lines. Because you're standing and yeah. waiting and other people are. And if you, yeah. this is a genius idea, by the way. <laughs> and if you, I'm telling you, this is what my genius idea is. I speak to strangers all the time. So I, uh, I'll, I'll ask them. I was like, because they're not doing anything else. They like got to keep right. doing with your thing on the, the treadmill, whatever it's called. Or, or whatever. There's always like yeah. movement, but inactivity mentally. Cool. Um, so I'd ask them and like, hey, can I run this pitch by you? What do you think? Here's what I do. What he is. Or, you know what I mean? Do you understand what I, you know, you yeah. can do that. Anyway. You totally could. I'm a huge introvert, so the thought of doing that makes me want to it's like, vomit. It scares me, right? Yeah, my but, wife's a huge introvert too, so great. she's like, she's like, can you stop speaking to strangers? It makes me feel really. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah, it's an ongoing battle. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's hilarious. And then after you test in Twitter, then delete your account, right? That's the that's we were talking about earlier. How how Twitter's like the worst platform. There's no Twitter's food insane. comes on. Twitter's insane. insane. Uh, yeah, that's why I don't. That's why I try not try not to tweet. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Okay, so let's say. Okay, so let's say I am not. I want to market to uh, a VC. Okay, I am not. I'm a service provider, and I yeah. want to connect with the VC. What would you recommend? They're not looking yeah. for funding. I'm looking to connect with the VC that might be able to. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I can help some of their portfolio, their clients. Yeah. Well, how, how would you recommend? I mean, they're pitched so much, but usually yeah. they're pitched by people looking for money. I'm not looking for money, but I am maybe looking for to build a deeper connection, to expand my yeah. network, maybe a business business. And you probably get a lot of that too, probably yeah. much less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, how does one go about? Because yeah. everyone's always looking for them. I mean, they got the money. Someone's hitting them up, right? Right. Totally. So again, I would say similar principles apply, but I would say the the thing is to go as specific as possible. So first of all, um, take a look at their portfolio. Don't just, you know, VCs are deaf. Nobody should be getting cold anything really, but but VCs for sure not because again, the traffic of how much they see and what they get, it is also from service providers because everyone knows if you can get into the VC and you can get into the portfolio, blah, blah, blah. But first take a look at the portfolio and see what you actually have to offer specific companies. Pick out a few companies and even sort of like give it a few minutes of thought. What could I do for that? Am I, first of all, do I have a niche? Do I have a sector that I'm specifically attuned to or whatever, or that I have companies I've worked for or that are similar and get really specific. So if I can approach somebody and say, hey, I noticed that you guys invest in a lot of X and specifically these two companies, which are at this stage and are might be struggling with this and this thing, Here's an interesting idea, and you can you can be totally you could go for the kill and say I have this solution. Here's you know let's talk blah blah. Or you could say, look, I just want to offer you know a, a free consultation. I wanna I wanna spend some time showing you what what's possible. Or here, this is an interesting read that I wrote. Like take a look or whatever it is. If you can kind of because I think you alluded to this and we've spoken about this before, and a lot of people know this. It's the relationship building. You're not, you know, like how many times do you get a sale on a first email or phone call or anything? It just it never really works that way. So I think, you know, and, and by the way, when it comes to the VC, knowing that they're constantly investing in startups and their startups have constantly changing needs, you want a relationship here. You're, you're not going for a one off at all. Um, VCs talk to other VCs, startups talk to other startups, especially when they're early and they're young and they know people and then they grow and have their exit and they make new companies. This, this is a network. So don't forget that. Don't forget it's a network. People talk. Um, so you really want to focus on the relationship aspect. Get to know what the VC is about before you approach. And then when you approach, do it as you would, you know, in a sort of Hey, here's a handshake. Let's, you know, here's here's what I have to offer. Here's what I know about you. Here's what you could know about me. Make it a relationship. Don't don't make it a sale. It's never going to be. A Do sale. emails ever work? Hitting up VCs, whether you're a service provider or a tech company. 
I would say that the um the again, it sucks, but intros, connections, it's just a truth. And I have had people cold reach out to me who maybe I kind of knew their name and I, you know, whatever, or, or and, and I have <laughs> <laughs> I, there are people who I have been intrigued by and I, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, I had some familiarity with their name or, or their service or whatever, but usually it's, it's an intro. It, it's just somebody telling me, Hey, I've worked with these guys, check them out. Or, you know, I have a problem and I want to reach out to somebody to find out if they know somebody, it's just the way it is. So, so that's why the relationship building is even more important. The more relationships you have in general, the more connections you have to, I mean, this is LinkedIn, right? Like, like I'm now literally preaching to the choir, but, um, but yeah, it, it's just, you just have to be a person and talk to people. That's, that's really what it comes down to. It's not selling. Preach ever. sister, preach, preach. If anyone has any last comments or questions, let us know. Cause we'll, we'll be, uh, we'll be wrapping up. We'll be wrapping up shortly. All right. So over six years at our crowd, right? So what have and you're doing marketing there? Mm -hmm. It's kind of different. How do you market our crowd? And what can we learn from that? Because it's, it's one in a sense you, like you mentioned in the beginning of our live, it's kind of like a marketplace. You have the VCs you're trying to reach and the tech companies, right? Yeah. Um, but how do you do marketing there? Like how do I'm just, yeah. I'm just curious. It's, it's a unique animal. So I'd love to hear more. It's totally unique. So the truth is, is that this concept of, what's technically called equity crowdfunding or you can call it hybrid VC or whatever you want to call it. It's really new. Okay. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like less than 10 years old. Um, right. And our crowd started back in 2003. It was the seed of an idea in 2002. It, it got off the ground in 2003. Sorry, 2013, 2010. What am I saying? 2013. Um, and so there was a lot of education, like literal education and knowledge building that had to come with that because people on the ground, like the retail investors, like we call them the individual investors, they didn't know VC because it was never an option. They never had million dollar checks and the kind of connections you could you could make to get into a, an established VC. So suddenly you could write a $10,000 check and invest in a startup and, and what does that mean and how do you do it and what does it look like and what's you know, how do you be successful doing that? So the first layer was like education. So literally going out and explaining to people what it means to do this, how to do it. Here's what it looks like when it's successful. Here's what it looks like when it's not. Here's, you know, how to build an investment thesis, literal education. So that was a big, big, big part, especially in the early days. Um, then it's really, you know, for us, it was really the brand building. It was really just making sure people understood um, when it comes to this specific type of service we can offer, you know, it's our crowd and our crowd's not just, by the way, an investment, you know, a VC investment firm. It's so much more. It's a gateway into Israeli startup landscape. That was a big part of our brands. It still is, I'm speaking in past tense because I'm not there. Um, but a gateway into, into the Israeli landscape it's a gateway into the startup ecosystem globally because as our crowd expanded and had more offices around the world and more partners around the world, it, it, it expanded out. Um, so it's it's understanding, you know, because not just investors come to our crowd, corporates come to our crowd to get corporate investing opportunities, to get partnerships with startups, potentially acquisitions. There's a whole business development side of our crowd right. um, that we haven't even talked about. So, so like, there's a lot of arms, you know, reaching out and, and it's, it's become an ecosystem more than anything else. And so there's a lot of things our crowd can provide to you depending on who you are. And so getting all that out meant building this brand that you can understand, you know, there's different doors to walk through to get involved in this, in this brand. So going back, so there's the, the, the education, the knowledge center aspect of it. Um, there's all the PR and, and storytelling that's going on publicly, you know, and that's new story. That's from like news stories, but then also, you know, we have the global investor summit every year that, you know, I worked on for six years. Um, that summit is the in-person real life version of what we do all year, um, online, virtually in meetings and in small investor meetings and all kinds of stuff. So like, different ways of building up that story that this is a place to come. That's, that's what the core of that marketing was about. Then there's the thought leadership, which I alluded to before, which is something that in the last couple of years, we really worked a lot on, which is really building out voices from, from within our crowd to try to get that knowledge out there through people, literally their faces or whatever.
Like this. This. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it really is a unique animal. And I think a lot of people really think they're, they're dealing with unique animals, but I think a lot of things sometimes when it's marketing, I think a lot of things are kind of uh, a, like applicable, like to everything. So, I mean, oh, yeah. you mentioned early on about like trying to target VCs, like storytelling is like a big thing, right? LinkedIn stories is going to roll out globally very mm -hmm. soon. Yeah. Um, so being able to tell just your story and <clears throat> see who's following you and whatnot. Um, and, and just kind of just interacting and building able to just continue, build a story, build a reputation, build an audience, continue to provide value is really the great way. And then what happens is you, and I'm just saying this from personal experience, it might be a little more harder when you're trying to ta uh, get the attention of VCs. But then when you can reach out to them, they might already know who you are. They've already probably seen you in their feed. Yep. They've already seen you a few times. So they right. might have read one of your blogs if you're reaching out to someone in a very relevant niche, yeah. right? And and you're writing about that niche, and you mm -hmm. might find yourself that they were they might not you know even where they got the intro like oh this is the intro I've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. So I it's, it, yeah. I also yeah, want to add just to just to encourage people because I think a lot of people get caught up in the idea that if you're going to do video or you're going to do whatever article or whatever. It's not a million dollar project. It doesn't have to be, you know, Hollywood quality, anything. Anything you're doing doesn't have to be. If you're authentic in the content you're putting out and the knowledge you're sharing, and it's really coming out that way, and you have something valuable to say, people will be excited to read, watch, listen, whatever it is. People want that. And, and I think there's so much noise that, yeah, it's hard to cut through it sometimes, but as long as you stay authentic and true to your like core and what you know and what you want to share, that will help project you out there. And yes, the polish of having a nice looking, you know, whatever is good, but just be real and it will come out. Because if you're worth anything, like that's enough. Uh, not, it's not everything, I, but. You know, it's funny though. So I think that being real and authentic is, is extremely important. But make sure you're the right person being real and authentic. So <laughs> would, I'm just going to say this. Yeah, and, this yeah, goes yeah. Back, and it goes back to like the presentation thing when you appear like presenters or panel. It's like you have someone who's a fucking genius, but they have yeah. no personality. Why are you on stage? Yeah, so if you have yeah, someone yeah. pitching, you don't want – if you happen to have, let's say, a very introvert tech person, engineer, maybe, maybe not the most socially adaptable, right. able to read the room or a conversation, and they might know your product and they might be the brainchild of product and the most excited and everything – that person's authenticity might not serve you well. He or yeah. she might not be the right person to speak to the right. VC, or the person might need to yeah, yeah. not be so authentically them. I often right. have to filter and be, I can't always be authentic. Sometimes I'm even over the top for people. I know what it's like to just you know, put something on, uh, put, uh, put a yeah. face on. Uh, wait, uh, people want to hear more from you. Vanessa uh, Epstein, uh, she wants you to elaborate more on storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sure. do, do you want to elaborate? Can you elaborate more because, uh, and also about authenticity, uh, which yeah, I, sure. I I continue to. We're talking more about authenticity now. Is yeah. that by the way the reason to be authentic is because it's the easiest. It's related to the sense of people say, "Do what you love," and it doesn't feel like work, right? right like right. you just want something through. that comes natural. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just who you are. Just be yourself. It's also where your value is. Like, like there's no value. I'm not going to be very good at showing you my value if I sat here and made up some stuff about an area I'm not knowledgeable in. It, it, it comes out. So, so to answer Vanessa, to talk to Vanessa for a second. So, I will say that um, again, like it starts from the fact that we have to remember that I'm a person. I'm made up of all kinds of pieces. You're a person. I'm talking to you. I understand that you're made up of all kinds of pieces. And if we start from the point of view that we're just people talking. I think that already like helps, which is why I'll go back to another point I made, which is talk to everyone, like do your pitch to everyone, talk to everyone. You yep. have to kind of get comfortable with your story and your words and talking to people who are different. I think that's really, because right. if, if you just talk to a mirror, you're not getting any feedback. Oh, and people that talk on stage do this regularly. I know people listen to Joe Rogan, um, which everyone does, uh, but he basically, you no, know, he talks about regularly like, how he goes and he practices jokes in small clubs and yeah. he sees how long do they react, how do they laugh, okay. He'll try a different audience, how do they react, okay, and he'll make yeah, changes. Yeah. He'll continually adapt and adapt and adapt. Seinfeld jokes. still does it. Seinfeld yeah, does everyone it does it right, he'll yeah, show yeah. up. Right, right. So their, their authenticity is great, but always be testing your message. Always try to, like you have to be consciously always trying to improve, which I think yeah. is much harder for people because people don't want 
the negative feedback. You right. know what I mean? You have to be open to the feedback. It's a muscle. It, it's like working out. Not that I know a lot about that, <laughs> but but like <laughs> how authentic of you. <laughs> I, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know a lot about it. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about something I, I don't know anything about. <laughs> right, but the muscle part of it I get for the most part. I used to run, so like, I, also used, to I run. used to run <laughs> before I worked at Aircraft. I used to crawl too, but I was like one years old. Yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, I think that the the fact is, is that you build you build your muscle when you talk more, you test more, and and it really that that's part of it. And I think you'll learn to kind of like find your pitfalls because like I I also feel like sometimes we have these pitfalls where we think something doesn't sound good, we're trying to cover it up or make it sound bad. Like just just again, like if if you're if what you're trying to get across is as good as you think it is, and it really is like important for people to know it. Speak English, like say it, and 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 just get your your message down to the main point so that people it's can share it. Right here. Yeah, Maybe don't, that's be, don't be too true. technical. Keep it simple to your audience, right? Yeah. If you're not speaking uh, for V, by the way, for VCs or things like that, yeah. But in ad copy, I find being technical is extremely important. Um, but that's uh, well, I'll go into it for one yeah, second. I guess that's advertise for one second. Yeah. But okay, so if it's organic, right? The more clicks, the better, or whatever, right? You want to make it flashy. When it's ads, you pay for the click, not the lead. Often, especially on LinkedIn, you well, it depends on the whoever. Generally speaking, you pay for yeah. the click. Right. So you don't want a sexy ad or too right. generic. You're going right. to get clicks of people that, that either. Relevant that aren't relevant, that aren't going to convert, or if they do convert, they're not yeah. in market, they're too high funnel, they're too awareness. So being technical will lower your click through rate, which is fine, which is actually yeah. my opinion, the good thing. You're too yeah. technical, but those that click will have a high conversion rate and your cost per lead will be uh, will be much better. Moises yeah. says we're very buggy. It was pausing a little bit. I'm going to go with that's you, Moises, because you're the only person to say that. <laughs> if anyone's agrees with Moises, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Liz, before we wrap up, is there anything else you want to share? This was totally fun. I'm so yeah. excited. If you guys have more questions, put them in the in the comments. I'll I'll go right on exactly. And, and also, uh, you can reach out to Liz directly, or if you want to reach out to me, um, Liz, can I make a connection to you if people ask? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. she said no. So sorry, guys. <laughs> 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 and if you want to wade into the swamp that is Twitter, I'm always there too. So you can have fun she, with that she's too. a good. <laughs> She's a good tweeter. Okay, see, Moises says on Facebook, it's fine. LinkedIn's a problem. And that's because you can't go live directly on LinkedIn. That, mm. That's a LinkedIn issue, unfortunately. Uh, nothing we can do there. Uh, in any event, but that's good. We actually we got hundreds of viewers, and we still got over a dozen live now. All right, thank you, everyone, very much for joining us. Liz, where can people find you? Um, you can find me on social media anywhere, at Eli Sheva. It looks like this, E-L-I-E-S-H-E-V-A, or you can... Find me on LinkedIn. My email address. Find Liz is Cohen on LinkedIn. You'll find me. <laughs> I'm right there. Tag somewhere. You don't have to do the hokey pokey. Just find her. Search Liz <laughs> Cohen, or you can yeah. message me, and I'll connect you guys. Liz, thanks so much for joining us, and Thank this you. is going to end our broadcast. Thanks everyone for your comments and questions. I'm doing another AMA next week with AJ Wilcox, the second best LinkedIn ads expert in the world, after yours truly. He's over in Utah, so get ready for that next week. Take care.